Rachel, do you want to just oh. quickly introduce your boil and broth company to everybody that's uh, out there? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm the founder of Boil and Broth. I actually started the business back in 2018. Um, I started bubbling bones, boiling broth back in 2017. And the reason I got into bone broth was because I had a whole heap of gut health problems. Um, I'd not long had my children and I, I was overweight. I was actually 16 stone. And um, yeah, and I, I was just on this roundabout of the NHS, you know, going to with my with my symptoms, they'd give me medication, I'd come away. And I went did this for about three years. And then I just really got to the point of I can't keep going on to this roundabout with the NHS. So I had to sort of take my hand, my health into my own hands, which I'm sure a lot of people watching this now have had the, the same experience. Um, yeah, so I started on the rabbit hole journey, you know, deep down in the rabbit hole, what's going on in the gut. Um, and as a result, I learned all about, well, not all about, but I had, a, I gained a good understanding of gut health enough to sort of make me start thinking that perhaps my condition, which was actually candida overgrowth, I don't know if anyone is familiar with it, but it, interestingly, some a, a carnivore paleo diet is, is perfect for it because it can, it, it, if candida overgrowth is a condition that feeds off of sugar in your body so it the more it grows the, the more sugar you have in your diet the more it grows it infiltrates the digestive system and as a result you get a whole ton of symptoms so i started on the bone broth journey and i also started to make kefir water as well which is a naturally um probiotic drink sparkling and yeah i i, I and i cut out all sugars so pretty much went into more of a, a, a paleo carnivore type i just i did have a few you know, sort of veggies and all that sort of thing. But the main core part of the change of my diet was the broth and the kefir water. And within 12 weeks, I'd completely reversed my health condition. I'd completely got rid of candida overgrowth. I'd been struggling at the NHS for, for three years. And then um, after two years, I actually lost six stone in weight. So naturally, I just went into business. And, you know, the passion within me was really about, you know, getting this message out there that, you know, that actually, you know, the, it, the system is so corrupt and the, they actually want us to be sick. So really the only way to, to make, get to get better is to take health into your own hands and do the research, you know, follow, you know, guys like yourselves, you know, and really important influences in this space who have the correct information that can, can share it out. So yeah, and then obviously Boil and Broth was born out of this. Um, been selling frozen bone broth for, for five years now. We've got a small team, a factory shipping all over the world. We sell for pets as well because the pet space is just as corrupt. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and my husband works for me and it, it's good. You know, we've just innovated the broth to basically make a pure broth protein now. So we remove all of the water from the broth as part of our preservation um, instead of freezing. And then by doing that, that means that the we're left with pure broth protein and then we can ship it anywhere in the world and then the customer just needs to rehydrate it back and can have it as a, a warm nourishing drink so that's what I always say ditch your coffee get your broth instead in the morning so yeah that's brilliant <laughs> excellent that's brilliant have you met Richard before no, I haven't. I've, I've only seen your stuff on social, so it's good to meet you. <laughs> yes, you too, Rachel. Pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on. Fantastic story. Um, yeah, I'd be interested in, in speaking uh, you know, uh, off air in regards to that because I, I operate and run um, a keto low-carb carnivore uh, website. Um, so, I mean, if you're looking for stockists for the broth, uh, I'd be interested in, in, in chatting that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, and, and it's something that people can do at home as well, isn't it? It's just it is highly time consuming in regards to chicken, which is around 24 hours, yeah. I believe. Oh, so. it's a nightmare. I mean, look, you know, I, I've I've had slow cookers. At one point in my house, I had nine slow cookers bubbling away. Because <laughs> you know, it was just at the point. And then we switched to pressure cooking because it was better for nutrition. It's also cuts down the histamine levels. It's also quicker for our production as well. So now we just cook broth under pressure and it works so much better for, for the product itself. Um, but yeah, you know, anyone who's tried broth at home, you know, it's time consuming, it's smelly, 
you know, if you're really bad at it, like I was initially, you know, then I, I didn't remove the fat. I When I first had my first cup of broth, I kept the fat with it. And I'm, so, I'm sure all the cardboard people are thinking, yeah, go put the fat. But, but actually, I didn't really enjoy it. So, you know, it was, a, a, it, you know, and making broth, it is an art because you do have, you know, it can, there's so many variables that can go wrong, you know, in making a really good broth. You know, we don't add any vegetables with it. People often add vegetables for flavor. Um, we don't, we add more bones because we want, protein and that's essentially what broth is all about it's about the proteins the amino acids in the in the broth itself that are the are, are the, the the you know the game changers for people's gut health the collagen particularly you know a lot of people don't realize that as we age our collagen production slows down so you know having a natural source of it to replenish it is great and, and broth is perfect for that because you can't get any more natural Exactly. And I think, you know, people don't give collagen the credit that it deserves. Um, you know, f through the carnival community, there's lots of people who won't eat the gristle on the bone um, or the marrow from the bone or the stringy bits in the steak. And that's where the collagen is, which is incredibly important. So for those people who are avoiding, I, I eat bone and everything. I'm, I <laughs> I'm a bit of an animal when it comes to that. But I mean, these are ideal you know, substitutes, isn't it, in regards to collagen replacement, because collagen, uh, you know, particularly one and three is incredibly important, you know, one uh, predominantly from, from marine, isn't it, which is predominates the body yes. and, and bovine, which is, which is number yes. three, uh, which is ideal for intestinal health. Um, okay. But, you know, it's, we need one and three in particular. Um, and I think even within, uh, you know, the carnivore community, the people that I work with, it's, it's something that is, is missing. Um, my first piece of advice, you know, as I'm sure yours would be, is, is to eat the stringy bits and, and the cartilage off your bones. But if you're not into that, you know, then, then the collagen shots, you know, the, the broth um, shots, I, that's what I drink in the morning occasionally. Um, okay. it, you know, and pe people look at me stupid. So instead of having a cup of coffee, you know, it's a cup of, uh, of, of bone broth, um, <laughs> which is fantastic. You know, it, it's just a case of getting used to something different. And I think that... Uh, I think there's going to be a big change in the UK over the next couple of years in regards to coffee shops stocking things like this because yes. the, the movement is growing and people are understanding how important that you know the replacement of collagen. Well, Richard, or collagen there has to be a change, you know, and these, you know, the coffee shops and the places they need to be part of leading that change because people, the, the nation is sick, you know, not just the nation, the world is sick, you know, the amount of people that come to us, you know, even vegans come to buy broth from us because they might have been vegan for you know the last 10, 15 years or something, and their body is literally stripped of all the nutrients, you know, and and they they come to us and they're like, help, you know, my my gut health is in a terrible state what can I do and and yeah I just say you know the best thing you can do is get some protein into you <laughs> it's re yeah. it's really very simple you know because these people have been depleting themselves of these vital nutrients for such a long time and you know and I think unfortunately they, you know mainstream messaging there is still a lot of the wrong information out there you know you'd go to the doctors they haven't got a clue they have not got a clue you know and I, I don't I'm not here to diss doctors I'm not talking about all doctors I'm just saying you know the doctors that often with the GPs that you go in and you're just on a routine roundabout appointment with them and they're not trained it's not their fault they just don't have that education yeah I agree and it's uh, you know we are it's indoctrinated from such a young age that we need fruits and vegetables for vitamins and minerals because that's the first question that I get asked as yeah. a carnivore is where, where are your vitamins and minerals coming from well Fruits and vegetables, I hate to break it to everybody, are not a good source of vitamins and minerals. Um, right. Vitamin A, retinol, we cannot get from plants. Plants okay. contain beta carotene, which is a precursor that needs to be acted upon by an enzyme called BCMO to convert it into the active form of retinol. Plants do not contain high levels of, of B vitamins, particularly vitamin B12, cobalamin. Um, you know, we do not get vitamin K from plants yet. This is what's stamped on kale, isn't it, in the supermarket, right. vitamin K. But yeah. kale contains K1, the human body needs K2, uh, and the list goes on, creatine, carnosine, carnitine, taurine, all of these things that we can only get from animal proteins. And one of the other biggest misconceptions is that vitamin C, where do you get your vitamin C from? Well, meat can, contains vitamin C, you know, so it, um, unfortunately, we are fed this, uh, pardon the pun, or pun intended, <laughs> uh, you know, we are fed this massive load of rubbish, isn't it, in regards to plants being uh, fit for optimal health. Unfortunately, they 
they bind to lots of the nutrients and they prevent the absorption. They're anti-nutrients, plants are anti-nutrients. They prevent the absorption of these essential uh, amino yeah. acids, collagens. Um, and, and I can understand. So I work with vegans and vegetarians. Um, yes. You know, I, I respect anybody's dietary choice, uh, but I, I, I try to to uh, educate, you know, as much as I can, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, and the people that I do work with, I find that they suffer with sarcopenia later in life, you know, muscle wastage, osteoporosis, yeah. because they're not con consuming these essential nutrients, which we can get from meats and bone broths, you know? Yeah, and Richard, oh, I think you hit a point, good point there, you know, that there is so much misinformation out there. And people, you know, and I, I like you, I do respect everybody's health choices, you know, their diet choices. But at the end of the day, you know, there is a lot of misinformation out there. And it's gonna, it's getting worse because, you know, we've got all these, you know, I, I, the, the AI chatbots, you know, they write blogs, you know, people when they're searching stuff, they could start be researching really bad things. This is why it's so important to have leaders in the space, influencers that people can go to for the right information. Because otherwise, you know, it, it really is going to become a major issue. And just going on to the point of vegetables earlier with the, with the lads that you had on prior to me, you know, they were talking about environmental toxins. And, you know, it, they're, they're really, that really is a major issue. You know, people don't realise that, you know, farming you know it, it, they they do they are using pesticides they are using you know unnatural things on our fruits and vegetables you know so if you're going to eat fruit and vegetables try and make your own try and grow your own <laughs> you know yeah. and and people don't need a lot of space to grow their own vegetables you know i think that's really you know important to say you you can you can just grow them in pots you know you don't have to have a massive allotment to grow your own veggies yeah, definitely. There's lots of miscommunications. I mean, you know, some of the arguments I get are animal cruelty, yet uh, <laughs> anyway, I'll say animal lovers. Uh, I, I love animals. Uh, that's why I consume my food locally from a farm two miles away, um, all grass fed, grass finished. The animals are well looked yeah. after. One, one cow would feed me for a year, which comes from two miles up the road. So I'm okay. uh, helping, you know, the, the environment uh, in regards to pollution and I'm not desertifying because what people don't understand is when they eat, you know, vegans and vegetarians, they consume these foods. You need to desertify a field which kills a whole ecosystem, destroys the microbes in the ground and, and that, oh, that right. land becomes desertified. It can never be used again. Yeah. It, can, it kills a whole energy. ecosystem. Um, yeah. And uh, have you seen the combine harvesters when they, they plough a field and there's, there's all the, the seagulls and birds above? That's because yes. of all the dead animals that are caught within that machinery. Oh. And these vegans and vegetarians don't understand that. You know, they, to, to desertify the field kills 10 times more animals, you know, than, than it does to, 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 to feed uh, a carnivore lifestyle. Uh, and what do they do? They, they, they you know, uh, buy av avocados and these exotic fruits which are flown <laughs> in from all I over know, the world. Yeah, from Mexico, you know, from yeah. the drug cartel. I know it's yeah. insane, honestly. Yes. And um, I, I have to say, sorry, just to interrupt, because Stephen has brought on his lovely dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I brought my dog in because I just wanted you to say, talk about that you do carnivore stuff for dogs. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that this is a, just really a testament to how natural our bone broth is because we do we put nothing in it, just three ingredients. That's it, and we home make our apple cider vinegar as well because we're fortunate enough to live on an orchard. But the greatest thing is is that we have a dual license to reduce the bone broth for pets and for human consumption. The broth that we sell for the pets is actually no different to the one that we sell for the humans. We just have to have a license and a different label to put on it. But essentially, you could buy a pot of broth for yourself and share it with your dog. That's how. That's how or vice versa. Yeah, or vice versa, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that to the point of us doing this was because, you know, we do see that there are, you know, issues within the health space for pets as well. You know, they are not getting access to a lot of their correct information. And there's a really big drive in the raw feeding community now for pets, which is amazing, you know, because so many vets in the UK really stand for raw feeding. You know, they they highly recommend carnivore diets for dogs. And absolutely, dogs aren't meant to eat you know um they're not meant they're not meant to be herbivores at all you know um so broth is a great way to supplement a dog's health as well so you know for the same benefits is why you would have it for for a human which is for inflammation reduction in the gut 
um, for collagen benefits as well, um, and also joint and ligament benefits, particularly for dogs, you know, especially as they get older, you know, they do need that extra glycosam gly glycosamine and chondroitin in, in their bodies as well. And that's another um, amino acid um, structure that can that, that's found within bone broth too. So yeah, it's really, really good stuff. And just, just, I just want to go on to something that Rich was talking about there. Uh, this is from the Smith, 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 Smithsonian National Zoo and Conserv <laughs> Conservation <laughs> Biology <laughs> Institute. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, in a year, 67 million birds are killed due to pesticides, agricultural pesticides. Um, 672, they reckon, across the world. In a year, yeah. that's yeah. a lot of death. And destruction. Awful. So, it is uh, awful. you know, and these are the things that don't really get exposed. Do you know what I mean? You know, mainstream media is just always yep. because they have the power, they have the majority, you know, so they're able to push that that narrative out there. Um, but, you know, the, again, as I'm reconfirming, you know, this is why it's so important to have these sorts of shows on, this sort of, you know, network for people to be able to come and get the right information. Um, because, you know, I was horrified when I went on my own health journey to, to see, you know, um, just how you become on a conveyor belt. You know, you go in with your symptoms, they treat your symptoms, you come out with something else. And then, you know, it's, it's not just that, it's when people come to you and they've got the problems. I'm sure you guys are both the same. You, you hear that all the time where people are just stuck on, on medication and they don't know how to get off of it. And actually, the first thing to do is diet. It has to be. Oh, for yes. sure. Yeah, for sure. It, uh, it is a shame. I mean, one industry feeds the other. Um, and yeah, I mean, thank thank you for coming on and spreading the word as well. I mean, it's I, I've I've been living this lifestyle for 10, 11 years and screaming it from the rooftops. But a lot of my content um, seems to be blocked on on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. As such, my following hasn't grown. So I've been screaming this for 10, 11 years, um, and I I don't have a following, um, you know, anywhere near the size of some of these other influencers. Um, and and I think. It's because content I've put out earlier, um, which is a shame and it's tough. You know, Stephen and I were speaking about this yesterday with me in, in regards to trying to improve that following in order to get that message out. But a lot of my my items, posts have been censored over the years. Yeah. I, I must be in Facebook and Instagram jail or something. But these are fantastic ways, isn't it, to get that message out there. I mean, this Perfect. is the first ever 24 hour you know keto carnival live um and i think you know a, a big thank you to everybody that, that, that's coming on to help spread that word you know and, and thank you in particular yeah. as well but uh, it's an also, I, you know, it's such an important message. I mean, you know, our diets naturally, the human diets are naturally carbohydrate based, you know, and um, and there's so much science and research and information now to say that, you know, more of a heavily protein fat diet is better for our bodies you know and if we go back throughout history you know most you know people were hunting they're hunt, hunting for food you know then they you know and eating grains and and natural foods from the land for for years you know and unfortunately because we've become so massive in terms of population there's just not enough food to go around to feed everyone now so you know everything's become genetically modified you know, trying to get us to eat insects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you and, seen and them Phil, on food yet? Have you seen it on food yet? Yeah. Even, even on some of the ingredients, they're slipping them in, you know? Yeah. So it just, it, it's, yeah, it's not great. It's not great. But that's why no. getting the right information and, and doing what you can at home. And eating local, I think, is the most important thing. For sure. You yeah, know, I eating agree. local produce, you know, because you don't know where it's, it, you know, again, for the, it's great for the environment, but also... You know, you don't know how food, what pans they pass through the further afield they go, you know. And I always stand by British farming. We do have the best farming in the world, for sure. I know it's not, no farming's perfect, but compared to the rest of the world. Yeah, I think so. And I think Phil and Ben made a fantastic uh, mention uh, when they were on about um, locally sourced produce and the fact that you couldn't sustainably live on um you know on on plant foods uh right. there's just not enough around we predominantly were animal based you know we would have spent days hunting and tracking an animal we would have caught and killed that animal we would have eaten everything within that animal that animal contains protein and it contains fat 
There's no carbohydrate within that animal. Yet we are told as a society that we cannot live without carbohydrate and carbohydrate predominates everything. And I think one of the biggest um, misconceptions which you know needs to be addressed, I think maybe you know, a point we can come back to you know, time and time again, but I'm sure everyone within the community already understands this, that we look at carbohydrates and sugar as being two different things. They are yes. the same thing. Carbs yes, is true. sugar. All carbs break into sugar. You know, okay. I, I haven't eaten. I haven't eaten any sugar, but I've eaten a bowl of pasta. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I've had a bowl of muesli. Um, but it's really you know, interesting. Sorry, Richard, but it's really interesting you say that because for me, in my own personal health journey, that was a real big education for me because yeah. you don't realise that your banana's got carbohydrates in. You, you know, it's just pumped into you. Yeah, your fruit's good. You've got to eat it. You know, but actually, it is full of sugars. Yes, they're natural sugars, but you're still your body doesn't go oh that's a natural sugar that's a processed sugar therefore i'm going to treat it differently your body isn't that intelligent it just or the the, the system isn't that intelligent it just says that sugar i'm going to deal with it as it deals with it you know um yeah i think you know there's so many misconceptions and i was gonna i was gonna say something to, then when, in a minute oh, it's gone from my mind sorry i've forgotten it will come back to me <laughs> broken your train of thought there isn't it but yeah i mean a bowl of muesli um, you know, I used to think was incredibly healthy. Um, you know, that, that bowl of muesli per 100 grams contains anywhere between 70 to 80 grams, which is, you know, around 20 teaspoons of sugar or, or 20, um, yeah, 20 teaspoons of sugar, isn't it, per 100 grams. Uh, and what did I used to do? I used to chop up a banana or, or add some berries. So I used to add sugar to my bowl of sugar, you know, and I, I thought that I was being healthy. Um, oh, but right. unfortunately, th you know, this is... Um, you know the brainwashing that has gone on, you know, since mm. uh, the 1950s, isn't it? and it, um, you know, mm. mostly is not and your friend. It, no, uh, it's not, and it's even worse for children. You know, I've got two children, and you know, the cereals that are around for the children, it's just a nightmare. They're, they're, you know, they say, oh, they've got extra, you know, vitamin D or you know this, and they'll, you know, this and that in there, but actually, the sugar in there is just insane. And when they say, so what they'll say on there is fortified with. Now, that fortified that's means, it, that's that's it. Fortified yeah, that's that's they, they have dug those minerals out of the ground and added them in. That cannot be, that cannot be good for you. You know, uh, digging mean, iron out of the ground and adding it to your food. And um, feeding surely, it to kids. <laughs> and feeding it to kids, yeah. You know, you know it's... it's so, yeah. so that, that's what fortified means. It's not is natural. That really, you know, is that what it means, is it? That they've actually yeah, dug it out? They've dug yeah. it out of the ground, yeah, and, and put, put it in, which is absolutely incredible. Our nutrients should come from the food that we eat naturally. Yeah, um not not <laughs> from not from the ground, at least in my opinion, anyway. What yeah, do you yeah. think, Steve? <laughs> well, I, I I was just looking in the chat there because someone wants to go to your website, Rachel. What is your wow. Yeah, yeah. Bring it. Oh, you can get free samples as well on the website. So it's www.oilandbroth.com. Um, if there's anyone overseas and they want some samples, just message us at info at oilandbroth.com. Um, but yeah, we've got um, free. So this, so what I was telling you about with the with the broth. So we've just going through a change, and as of, as from September, we're stopping all of our frozen bone broth. And the reason we're doing it is because it's just costing us so much money to make it and ship it now. And we can't ship it overseas because it's it, it spoils so quickly. So this is why we dehydrate now the broth. So it gets rid of all the water. It's ground down into a pure broth protein and then people just rehydrate it back. So five grams rehydrates back to 100 mils of bone broth. Um, yeah, and we're giving away samples on the website so people can go on and, and pick up a sample. They can try the dehydrated bone broth. We've got samples for pets. We've got samples for humans. We've got six different flavors for pets. We've got beef, lamb, chicken, venison, goat, and pork for pets. And then for humans, we've just got the three, chicken, lamb, and beef. But actually, we're also going to be launching a new venison flavor for humans as well, because I don't know if you guys eat venison at all, but it's becoming really, really popular now in the UK. Yeah, um, I would, I would well, say yeah, that this morning, well. yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, we were talking about coffee and giving up coffee. And I think um, substituting coffee with bone broth is, is a hack that a lot of people use, and it does work, actually. I think um, coffee is lovely. Uh, I have decaf, and it doesn't cause me any issues, but I understand the social side of it. So if you want to um, get off coffee, as we spoke about with Dr. Chafee and also with Dr. Kiltz, um, 
then bone broth is a really good thing to try as an alternative because it is tasty and it is nutritious and it's a hot drink and um you could sit there where you normally sit in the morning so you have your coffee and have your bone broth and uh because it's now dried it, you can su supply it. i mean i remember buying some off of you that was the liquid and i think actually it might be serendipity that you know costs have gone up and you've gone more into the dehydrated because it's easier to post and it's easier to store at home and then you just just make it like coffee granules you know it's just it's, yeah. it's so easy and simple and such a good thing to have a hot drink instead of coffee which is uh deleterious for most people and have something that's nutritious i think um you know hopefully people will take you up on that offer to go to your website so just it's it's boilandbroth.com is it yes it is yeah yeah, yeah and we right, do okay. And we do offer, so um, people in the UK can just go on and order samples normally, but at the moment our worldwide shipping is not great. So just email us um, and we can ship them out to you that way. Yeah. Well, um, I'm just going to answer a couple of the comments, by the way. Yes. Um, just just so people know, we, we've invited as many guests as we possibly could. And yes, we're going to have guests every half hour. So Rachel was very kind to come on. Um, we tried to get Ken Berry, but I think it's just been too busy for him to to get on. Uh, I don't think Dr. Chafee is coming back. He's given us three hours already. Uh, Dr. Kilts may come back, but we have got people booked um, all the way through the day. So uh, we're now four and a half hours into this 24-hour live stream. So Rich, we're out of out of the woods now so you know we've only got 19 and a half to go but rachel thank you so much for um appearing that uh, yeah, really great. appreciated it yeah thank you i'm really grateful to you for asking me to come on and richard if it is okay i'll contact you separately and um we'll have a chat about what we spoke about at the beginning so yeah thank you very much all the best for today it was really great thank you okay, okay bye bye Yes, so um, that was brilliant. Wasn't I was it? mooted. I didn't realise yeah. I was mooted there when I was. <laughs> Apologies, <laughs> Richard, if you're still listening. Yeah, I did say thank you, and yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah so, we, so yeah, I mean, just going into uh, what we were saying um, ab about that being nutritious. I mean, just before the next guest, if you want to just talk about what Keto Pro does, what you do, that'd be interesting. <laughs> from a, a severe health background and, and as such I, I've sold uh, three houses everything I own to put into the business in order to educate and help people along their journey in carb reduction removing seed oils grains uh, and ideally the transition into carnivore eventually um, and we support every stage of that so we support every stage of low carb uh, dirty keto clean keto and everything is, is signposted on the website so the, the products and foods that we do uh, will either be stamped keto pro approved which is the creme de la creme anything else is you know deemed to be keto friendly or low carb but no matter what what side of the fence you're on whether you're low carb dirty keto clean keto standard carnivore what type of carnivore you know there, there are products uh, and foods and, and snacks on there that um uh, that can help anybody along their journey. Uh, obviously, we always promote real food. Um, real food is, you know, is the way forward. What we do stock is clusters foods, um, and that's what we do. Part of our journey is, is to help educate, and that's what Stephen and I do every Sunday on the live. This is what we do on the website. There's a knowledge base on there with lots of free information, lots of free information on the YouTube channel uh, and Instagram, etc. But that's enough chatter for me. Um, on to uh, on to Dr. Rachel Brown. Hello, Dr. Rachel Hello. Brown. Hello. Would you like to introduce Hi, yourself to those people that don't know you? Sure, yeah. Um, so I work as a consultant psychiatrist in the UK, um, but I'm also qualified in functional medicine, so I have a real interest in um, looking at the root causes of illness, which I think uh, modern-day medicine doesn't do particularly well. Um, and I've been carnivore for four years now. Do you know Richard, That's by the way? I don't. Hello, Rachel. I, I don't think we've met prior to this, have we? No, have I'm on mute. You've, no. no, you've not met. No, we right, haven't. Okay. No, I'm not. <laughs> so, nice um, to meet you. No, no, Dr. Rachel. No, we haven't met. I think we've interacted a bit on Instagram, but that's been it. Brilliant. Oh, have you? What, did you have a bit of a ding-dong argument about something? No, I don't think so, is there? It, no, uh, no, I was only joking. Not, Rachel, yeah. can you hear us okay? <laughs> no. Sorry, I don't know if I've got a bit of a delay here, but I'll try and do my best. Yes, there is a delay. It's like speaking on a satellite. So do you want to give um, the listeners and viewers a little bit of background about why you 
ended up with you know being a carnivore gosh yeah sure so um gosh i've been interested in low-carb nutrition for decades now it's a couple of decades which makes me feel really old um but i came to carnivore via keto and it was really just um because of family sort of poor health um in older generations of my family and I, i've been doing I've been a big fan of Mark Sisson for years and I've been doing low carb, but not necessarily strictly keto for quite a number of years before I decided I was going to go strictly keto. And then I just came across Carnivore via one of um, my favorite keto influencers, which was Vanessa Spinner. So I'd followed a lot of her work um, for quite some time. And like a lot of people, I thought it was crazy when I first heard of it um, and I first saw it. I first was introduced to carnivore via just a food plate that she shared on her Instagram. And because I trusted her opinion on a lot of things, I felt um, there must be something in this if she's doing it. So I went down the rabbit hole and just researched it myself and, and the rest was history. Yeah. And I, th I think there is a slight delay, by the way. So um, Richard, do you want to ask a, a psychiatrist any particular question about carnivore and how it's helpful? Yeah, so it. Um, I mean, a lot of questions that that we get within the community, uh, you know, is regards to how the diet will affect uh, the catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis within the brain and how the brain functions. Uh, I did an interesting podcast with Jen Anwin recently in regards to food addiction, uh, and many people don't understand that the food that we consume massively impacts the way that the brain works and and, and the way that it makes us feel, isn't it? Um, do you want to go into a little bit of detail and, and, and explain a little bit about how this can affect the way we feel and, and the moods and, and because everything comes to, to me comes from 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 diet and I, I used to suffer severely with depression and anxiety and since becoming keto and, and carnivore uh, you know these things have, have gone away and I used to I used to tell people my life was spent living in boxes so I used to leave my box and jump in my metal box I drive to a big box where I'd walk into a small box. My life was spent living in boxes because of depression and anxiety. And through the foods that I've changed in my diet, I know I've been able to, to come out of that box. And now I do public speaking events to thousands of people what I couldn't have dreamt of doing before. And all of this is to do with nutrition. But when you tell that to somebody, they won't believe it because it doesn't come from a medication. You know, and it's um yeah, so if, if you wanted to go into a little bit of that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, sure, happy to. Um Gosh, where to start? There's so many different um, complicated pathways within the body that all interconnect. Um, it all it really it really astounds me. So I'm I'm part of a critical psychiatry network group, and there were some emails this week that I found particularly triggering, and it was in response to one of the psychiatrists in the group asking, "Is there any evidence that food can make a difference to major mental disorder?" And um, someone else in the group, very opinionated, said, "Oh, there's absolutely no evidence, and I'm sure we'd all be very happy if there was any evidence." Uh, and um, I was just too triggered to actually respond to that email chain because I have emailed them all before, but obviously they didn't pay much attention to my emails. Um, but it, it never ceases to amaze me when people say that what we eat has nothing to do with our mental health because um, our neurotransmitters, a lot of them are manufactured in the gut by our gut bacteria, particularly serotonin. Um, but don't get me wrong, it's not just about neurotransmitters in terms of having good mental health, but they're certainly a part of the puzzle. And in terms of all the enzymatic reactions that happen in the body, we need uh, vitamins and minerals to act as co those, those, those reactions. So, for example, production of serotonin, production of melatonin, um, conversion into those sorts of neurotransmitters or chemically active substances in the body come originally from amino acids, such as tryptophan. And where do we get our amino acids from? But we get it from our food. Um, and that's also where we get our vitamins and minerals and so on and so forth. And I think a good way of thinking about it is that whatever we choose to put into our body really does affect um, our body's response. Um, so our body always responds to our environment, um, be it toxins or uh, foods that we're putting into our body and part of those responses can include an immune system reaction. Um, but really I like to start off in the gut because I think I think the gut brain connection is absolutely crucial 
people and you know there are certain foods that are just terrible for for health in general never mind mental health and one of those is gluten um so we know that foods like gluten because of a component in the protein of uh, the wheat protein that leads to leaky gut and when you have leaky gut it means that there are certain bacteria and toxins within the gut and toxins that come from bacteria that can then leak across the gut barrier into the bloodstream and travel to sites distant in the body including the brain um, and when that happens we know it's very clear from research and um, particularly in relation to something called LPS which comes from gram-negative bacteria um, but these bacterial components trigger off an immune system reaction and an inflammatory reaction in the body. Um, and in the research literature, when we talk about peripheral inflammation, we are also talking about immune system activation. And that comes in the form of cytokines um, that are released. And there's a clear connection between the gut and the brain along the vagus nerve, but there's also chemical signaling that goes between those two organs back and forth. And when you have, we know from the research that when you have inflammation in your gut, you also have an inflammation at the level of your blood brain barrier. And then your blood brain barrier is quite similar to the intestine is how I often think about it because it's a, a similar single cell layer that can also become leaky. Um, and once you have a leaky blood brain barrier, this means uh, certain toxins and components from bacteria can cross over into the brain and cause inflammation in the brain. Um, so those are a few different mechanisms. Um, but there are, other, there are other aspects too, just um, in terms of oxidative stress being one. So having an imbalance between the antioxidants that we have endogenously in our body uh, versus pro-oxidant molecules that are formed as a result of different processes in the body, um, part of which can come from the food that we choose to eat. And so we know that having a high carbohydrate load in the body is inherently inflammatory and then this inflammation and oxidative stress can trigger off changes in the neurotransmitter pathways. So you, particularly the tryptophan pathway, that's a really good example where you can have tryptophan that is di diverted down the kynurenine pathway, which is essentially an inflammatory pathway in the body. And it means there's a bit of a tryptophan steal, so you don't produce as much serotonin um, or ultimately melatonin. And, and so you can see why that might give rise to mood symptoms or sleep difficulties at night. Um, so, so those are just a few, a few different pathways in the body. Um, but ultimately, um, in my opinion, it all starts in the gut. And, and that's often the opinion of other functional medicine practitioners as well. Yeah, I think, you know, looking at that, it, you mentioned inflammation there, you know, inflammation is the activation of the immune system isn't it uh, and all of these things seem to come from the foods we consume you know you mentioned um, serotonin which is an uh, endolamine um, and uh, synthesized from tryptophan uh, and as you say there's uh, other cofactors involved like iron zinc and b12 um, mm -hmm. now the foods we eat uh, that are caused you know, excess carbohydrate consumption for example will lead to insulin resistance and inflammation um, you know this can lower our immune system uh, in particular, things like the ACE2 receptors, leaving us more susceptible to viruses and infections. And when we get these viruses and infections, um, the body sequesters iron, doesn't it? Uh, it puts iron into ferritin and it takes it out of circulation. Now, one of the main cofactors to produce serotonin is out of circulation. So the body could have an abundant amount of, of iron stored in ferritin, but none of it is bioavailable. And then this affects the serotonin production. Um, so all of this comes back down to the foods that we eat, isn't it? Which again, people find absolutely crazy to understand, but what we eat massively affects the way that, that we feel and the way that the brain functions. Um, and, I, and I genuinely believe, I, 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 we've mentioned this before, we, you know, we're not against medication in the treatment for certain things, but predominantly, I think if you eat uh, a, a carnivore or ketogenic based lifestyle, low in carbohydrates, avoiding grains and seed oils, so we're avoiding glycation and oxidative stress, um, you know, we're, we're combating and reducing inflammation, and that's what BHB does. That's what beta hydroxybutyrate does, and it? it blocks NLRP3 inflammasome, uh, which is the main inflammatory marker in the body um, or pathway. And it um, all of these things uh, help prevent the, these illnesses. Now, our, our need for medication, uh, you know, goes away. I, I mentioned earlier in the talk. I can't remember the last time I've taken medication. Um, yet I was on an abundant, I was on a myriad of medication every day for all sorts of things. Uh, and now I am completely medication free, all from, from changing my, my, my diet. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It really frustrates me um, working particularly in the NHS where the food is terrible that people are fed in hospital <laughs> and um, we're, we're just piling on different medications on top of this underlying inflammation and immune system that activation that's going on and, and no, nobody really spends much time thinking about addressing the underlying cause and yes medications can help and they can help to suppress symptoms um, but as we all know no pharmaceutical comes without potential for side effects and I, I just wish that more people were aware that they could really ultimately improve their mental health by changing their lifestyle and what they eat um, and I don't think it's all about diet so I think other things are super important as well such as light routines particularly for circadian health um, and, and limiting toxins and, and so on. But yeah, diet's certainly a fundamental place to start. And I'd, I'd be very surprised if people could get to a place of um, complete wellness without doing something at least to address their diet. I'm a really big fan of Dr. Sarah Myhill's work and um, it's particularly a paleo ketogenic diet that she promotes for people and suggests and I, I think that's a really good place for people to start if they're you know not everybody needs to be carnivore but you, we certainly see a lot of people in this community who have amazing health transformations and I know of quite a number of people with major mental disorders who um, for whatever reason keto just didn't do it for them in terms of resolving all of their symptoms whereas carnivore is one step further um, in terms of promoting recovery so I think people have got different options and everybody's I say everyone's bio-individual, so particularly when it comes to our gut microbiome, you just don't know exactly where somebody's starting from unless you do detailed testing. And even then, I think there's so much that we don't know yet about that field. I, th I think the delay <laughs> is a little bit disconcerting for a few people, but I just wanted to know, um, I've got a question about <laughs> sleep, which I'm going to put on. Uh, if you want to answer it, that would be great. It's not as specific as uh, to your job but somebody here uh, tfc locks uh, i have problems with sleep on carnival wake up in the middle of the night like two to three times just wondering what your advice is on fixing this issue and also wondering butter is fine for the fat increase so you got any views on that rachel yeah so my first thought is that it might be a bit of a cortisol issue if you're um waking up in the middle of the night particularly if you're unable to get back to sleep and I suppose I would wonder a little bit um, sometimes gender can be relevant in this in terms of fasting protocols that people are doing uh, so I used to I started off carnivore doing quite a lot of fasting and then in the end just decided to stop s skipping breakfast because um, I think particularly for women having a meal early and earlier in the day can be really helpful for um, normalizing your cortisol uh, response during the day because I think I think a bad thing that some a bad habit that sometimes people run into is if they're just uh, fasting all morning um, particularly if you're using caffeine or co have coffee on board and you can end up just um, disrupting your circadian rhythms because food is a secondary uh, signal to the circadian clocks about what time of day it is and as well as getting morning sunlight um, I think if you're doing a lot of fasting, particularly skipping breakfast, then that might be one thing to try to scale back a bit because fasting can be an additional stressor on the body. And uh, the butter, yeah, I mean, I'm a fan of butter. I'm not, I think there's been quite a big trend in carnivore, um, in the carnivore community to add loads and loads of butter and, and brown butter bites and, and um, very intense, um, intense fat load into the diet and I think some people can run into difficulties with gaining weight on that but certainly from a fat point of view I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with butter I'm just not a huge fan of making it your main your main fat in your diet so I, I think it can be complementary to other other meats in the diet um, but there's certainly nothing wrong with butter unless you're someone who's highly sensitive to the casein so the the protein in in cow's milk in which case you might be better off using ghee or thinking about another fat such as tallow and more other animal fats. Rich, Fantastic. yeah, com yeah, completely agree with that. And and as Rachel rightly says, you know, fasting uh, can can be a contributing factor to elevated cortisol levels. Uh, you know, fasting is fantastic. I I tend to fast every day, but it can have uh, negative impacts on cortisol. Um, Another thing is, is inadequate sodium. Uh, inadequate sodium, uh, you know, in the diet can elevate cortisol. Um, uh, 
coffee. So you know, what what do we do when you know what do a lot of people do when they begin the carnival keto journey? They begin with you know the, the bulletproof coffee, isn't it? Uh, so they end up consuming way more coffee. Uh, and I know we've covered coffee a couple of times, but too much caffeine. Um, can cause disruption to the adrenals, uh, leading to increased cortisol. So all of these, it's not just the caffeine, but it's, it's again, the in interruption with cortisol into the, into the system there. And timings as well. So, um, you know, we're told to eat um, well before bedtime, but I eat just before bed. Uh, I find I don't sleep if I eat, you know, four hours before. And, and the reason that I do this, one, because I eat and I want to sleep, but I look at animals in the wild. Once an animal has caught its prey, and eating it, you know, it goes to sleep. We covered this earlier with Anthony Chafee, isn't it? That uh, that's what an animal does. Once once it's it's caught its prey and eaten, it goes to sleep. And that's what I do. So I tend to eat just before bed. Um, so there's a few things there to uh, to address. I think, isn't it? A few things to try and and agree completely with the butter. I think there are better sources. I'm a fan of butter. Uh, I think um, the casein is lower in butter than uh, the milks. Uh, you know, uh, again, I sort of put butter into a different category from milk. Uh, the casein content is a lot lower, but if you are susceptible to intestinal permeability uh, and suffer with those issues, then you know uh, tallow or ghee uh, would be a better option. But yeah, a, f a few suggestions there to uh, to implement and try possibly. But um, fantastic. Any thoughts from you, Steve? Well, I think after a twenty-four hour live stream, I might not have problem sleeping, but <laughs> actually, with the screen for twenty-four hours. I may, I may. And I think that that's one of the things I would always add. It isn't just about what you eat. It, it, it is about what you're exposing yourself to all, all day. And if you, if you sort of are on your iPad or a mobile device and you're watching something scary or the news triggers you, you're not making the environment conducive to going to sleep, are you? You're uh, yeah. using your animal analogy. You know, if you were out in the... Um, forest with your dog and you know the twigs were going and rustling was happening on your dog wouldn't sleep you wouldn't sleep because you'd feel like whoa i've got to, i've got to stay awake then if someone was flashing lights at you you'd be like oh i don't like that so but we're doing that we're we're exposing ourselves to noise and lights and things we don't know and things that annoy us or scare us and then go oh i can't sleep i can't yeah. sleep and it's like you know diet is in incredibly important but i think these other things that that we expose ourselves to we do need to look at so um Which circles yeah. back to exactly you know what uh, what rachel mentioned earlier about uh, these uh, external uh you know sources so diet you know fundamental but these external sources are massive contributing factors as well but what i tend to find is that when you begin this journey you know of, of self-improvement uh, these incremental changes, you begin to look at other things, don't you? You, you begin to look at um, cold water therapy and, and, and grounding and, and all these. You become a biohacker. You know, what began in, in just taking out bread, <laughs> trying to restrict carbohydrate. Now, suddenly, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a biohacker that's doing all of these things and biohacking your body in, in, into better health. And uh, it is an incremental system. But, yeah, f fantastic answers there, I think. Yeah, and I mean, this this reality chick, which is a great name, by the way, uh, coffee shops have become the sweet shops of the modern high street. Costa is in every hospital, and the sugar content of their cakes and pastries is off the scale. Um, I included that comment because I lost my parents m many, many years ago, and before I knew about carnivore, and certainly before I knew about low carb. And I have found it quite strange that they would feed this, you know, high. now I look back, high sugary meals and then give my uh, mother a sleeping tablet to help her sleep and she's in a stressful environment she had uh, well she died from it what she was in hospital for uh, but then at five o'clock in the morning they would wake her up to, to take all her readings so they they were completely messing up her circadian rhythms feeding her the wrong food um, and I think th that's a stressful situation so We've got a psychiatrist here, but not many people are asking questions that you would expect. You see, they're, they're talking more about environment and, and, and food in that, that respect. So I was wondering, we were talking about cortisol. Do you think, uh, Dr. Rachel, that it does raise blood sugar? You know, and if you're stressed, is that is that part of the mechanism of why some people can't sleep and, you know, feel anxious? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but unfortunately, in mainstream medicine that's not something that we look at or test <laughs> so 
in terms of NHS and mainstream psychiatry, um, I, you know, there will be a bit of an awareness about stress hormones and so on and being relevant when somebody presents in a highly anxious or agitated state. But um, I can't say from uh, the last 19, 20 years of working within psychiatry that that's something we actually look at objectively. However, it can be done, um, but people need to go privately, certainly in the UK, for that sort of thing. I mean, do you feel quite passionately about hospital food? Do you feel that they are going to look at that at some point and the cafes or do you just think it's just making too much money for them that you'll never make any inroads in, in getting people to eat properly in hospital gosh yeah that that feels like a mammoth uh, project to take on um particularly gosh the, the nhs is such a massive organization with um and, and very siloed so so many different departments and one health board doesn't necessarily work the same to the next um, it's certainly something I've had thoughts about in terms of the hospital I work in but in order to make any change on a big scale in the NHS that's very tricky very difficult there's quite a focus on quality improvement these days which can be helpful but it tends to be starting off on a very small scale so test out a very small project and then try to generalize that if you if you um, have good results from it so I'm not saying it's something that couldn't be done um, but it's it would certainly take a long time, I think, and a, and a lot of effort to to make any difference there. So, what do you what do you offer people? Um, do you offer online coaching, or can they contact you if they've got any anxiety issues? What what do you cover? Yeah, so I'm working now with um, my business partner Ali Houston, and we founded Metsci, um, so people can go to metsci.com, so it stands for Metabolic Psychiatry, and we do coaching there. Um, so we're doing small group coaching at the moment, and we'll have a course that will run ultimately twice a year for people who are just interested in metabolic approaches to mental health. Um, at the moment, I'm not doing any direct one-to-one -one private work, but that's something that may well change in the near future. So um, I'm looking into some different options there. Um I've just put your Instagram up on the screen as well. So people want to follow you, they can get that um, link and contact you, which would be really good. So, um, yeah, have you enjoyed coming onto the 24 hour live stream? I have, thank you. But my internet is doing my head in. So I'm going to have yeah. to contact my provider. <laughs> because I'm, I'm actually plugged, I know. I'm plugged in. So I'm not on Wi Fi and there's still a delay. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, there is a question just before you go. Uh, let's have a look. Any thoughts on increased ADHD in children these days? Is there a connection with the sad diet? Yes, absolutely. I would say. Um, so we, there's studies that show that um, particularly in autism and ADHD, there can be an increased susceptibility to leaky gut and this can then trigger off inflammation in the brain um, and so on. But there are also some slight genetic abnormalities that can mean that people have higher requirements for certain micronutrients. Um, for example, um, the MTHFR cycle, which is to do with folate and bioavailable folate is one that a lot of functional medicine people are very into testing. Um, but the, there, there's certainly a lot of evidence that um, and certainly in my mind as well, that the symptoms of ADHD can be treated via diet. And I've had people contacting me, just DMing me privately, saying that they've done really well um, in terms of improving their symptoms. Um, and you get cases within functional medicine that, that show complete resolution of symptoms, just looking at diet and lifestyle and environmental, um, environmental measures. So, so I, I, I'm not sitting here thinking that ADHD is a deficiency of stimulant medication. I'm not saying that those can't help some people, but I think there are other ways around, around looking at diet and nutrient requirements for that group. Yeah, I think I was listening to an autobiography, actually, uh, Lee Mack's autobiography, and he was diagnosed as, uh, he's a comedian, by the way, for the people that are not in the UK, and, you know, he's, he's as an adult, been told that he's got ADHD, but I think he also went vegetarian, <laughs> so I'm just wondering if there is a connection, but anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so, Dr. Rachel, thank you for coming on. Uh, Rich, do you want to say your goodbyes as well? 
Yeah, Rachel, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I'd love to connect outside of this and get you on the podcast as well. So if you're up for that, we'll we'll get something booked in. But fantastic chatting. Uh, I love going into into the weeds in regards to the science with things. And um, yeah, you've appeased my uh, my scientific nature with uh, with the combo today. So thank you so much for coming on board. <laughs> Very much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Yeah, happy to chat anytime. Sounds good. Ah, okay. Bye. Bye. Excellent. Lovely. Bye. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you.